there was in ancient times in my country a king. And this king went hunting. And he got lost. You understand? He got lost. So he started shouting, I am lost. It was late in the evening. But one man came and said, Oh, who are you? King. Oh, your majesty, don't worry. Sit down here. You are not lost. I live very close by. Sit down here. I am a baker and he came and brought some very special cakes. Very special cakes and said, Your majesty, eat my cake. Oh, the king was very happy. Very fine cakes. So he dressed up and took the king back to the royal palace. And the king thanked him and said, By the way, I like your cake so much. Can you bring me every week your cakes? I will pay you a large sum for it. He said, Yes, of course. So every week he brought cakes. And the king ate it. And one day the king said, You know, sometimes I eat a whole week's cake in one day. They are so good. Can't you teach these royal bakers how to make your cake? He said, no, no, this is something very special. To make this cake, there have been cows, seven generations of cows fed on seven generations different fields of grass grown. And hence seven generations of them with selected eggs. And the flower comes from wheat fields, seven different wheat fields, clean and hand select. And before I made this cake, before I made this cake, I whitewash my place and clean my floor with saffron water seven times. And I bathe seven times in this famous river and apply on myself jasmine perfume seven times. Before. You, you are bakers will never learn how to make this. Oh, yes, all right, the king said, okay. Then you bring it, more cakes I will take. Shortly after, the king went hunting, and he was lost again. But he knew that he was not really lost, because he got the smell of this cake. So he went on his nose, and he saw a dilapidated hut. And he looked through the crevice of the window, he saw rats running all over the place. Dirt never swept, cobwebs and this fellow sweating and putting it and making the cake. <laughs> Same fellow. King was very angry. Very, very angry, burst into the place and said, You, I saw you how you make the cake. Baker was silent. He said, I am lost, royal lord. Take me back to the palace. You shall be punished. So he took him back, silent. He said, Kneel down and tell me. You have told me one thing, and I saw how you make the cake. If you do not have a proper explanation, you will be punished. So the baker laughed and said, You may see what I told you was the theory, and now how I do it, that is the practice. I was uh, made a medical doctor rather against my wish by my father because my family has had been practicing traditional medicine. They never went to university or medical school for about 19 generations from father to son, only to the eldest son. That goes back to about 500 years. But when my time came, there were x-rays and many other spectacular things in Western medicine. So they decided me to send to send me to proper medical school in Colombo. Then those days they always gave you scholarships. They sent me to London and United States to Mayo Clinic and so on. And I came back after all studies and my father called me and said, son, I have not taken a holiday in 25 years. Can you look after my practice? I said, but of course, father, 
All knowledge of medicine in the world is here inside my head. So my father wanted to go on six months holiday with my mother and I found all his records were outdated. I updated them. All the medicines we, he was using were useless stuff. And uh, many patients he had been treating for 20, 25 years in one medicine, two medicines. One week, two weeks I cured them. I don't know what my father had heard from my, his six months holiday. He came back in three weeks and asked me, son, did, how, how did things go, son? I said, very well. I updated your records, I updated, I updated your medicine. Many of the patients you were treating for a long time, I cured them in two weeks, three weeks. There was one case of arthritis, you were treating for 25 years. Two weeks, I cured her. My father got a little alarmed and asked, was it that rich lady in the village you cured? I said, yes. And my father said, you damn fool, it was with her money I sent you to medical school. <laughs> First, let me write to you the common, traditional Chinese methods that are used today. When we look at traditional Chinese medicine, we have first Herbal therapy. Herbal therapy is the use of all the available herbs in that area for treatment of disease. It so happens that in all areas of the world, without exception, the commonest medicine was the locally available herbs that were used, whether they were so-called civilized or uncivilized or natives or aborigines, they always used their herbs. And throughout all time, the greatest specialist in herbal therapy was the grandmother. The grandmother knew best. Your fathers and grandfathers are living today, not because of penicillins and other sins streptomycins and so on, but because of the herbal therapy. All what is called modern medicine came in my period, in one lifetime, and before that, this is the mainstay of medicine, even of Western scientific medicine. And herbal therapy meant the use of herbs, animals, and minerals, many heavy metals like arsenic, Mercury, copper, they were, they were used and are being used in herbal therapy. Acupuncture. The word acupuncture comes from two Latin words. Arcus means a needle in Latin and punctura means to penetrate. We give the credit to the Chinese people for acupuncture, but it is not at all clear if you examine the history where it came from. It has been practiced by the ancient Hindus, Egyptians, in the ancient Ebers Papyrus. Now in the British Museum, you see acupuncture channels. In Greece, in South America, among the Mayas and the Incas, this has been practiced so that it is a fairly worldwide thing. Old books, I have brought one book which is about 2,000 years old from my own country which shows acupuncture meridians in animals, in the elephant for instance. It has been practiced and as of today in modern times, now they are talking about acupuncture in plants. After all, we have the same DNA and RNA. And if it does work in human beings and animals, why not in plants? And there is a very strong reason for it. We are, we are using 
mega doses of pesticides, fungicides, and all kinds of uh, synthetic chemicals which are harming our soils, our planet, so why not use acupuncture? In the same way, we are polluting our bodies with synthetic chemicals, so in many instances, acupuncture is the answer. That is called moxibustion. Moxibustion is the heating of certain points in the body which with a dried plant, the name of the plant is Artemisia vulgaris. I will show you how these things are done. Artemisia vulgaris and we use points very similar to the acupuncture points. The name of the plant is Artemisia vulgaris. That is the Latin name. Acupuncture and moxibustion are complementary to each other. They are not separate disciplines. The Chinese had one word for it. It is called Chen Qiu. And there is a fourth subdivision which is called, which was called surgery. In ancient times, too, they practiced surgery, but by and large, surgery was discouraged. Why? Many reasons. One was the Confucian doctrine, that the human body was sacred, that it must not be defiled in life or in disease, so no surgery, no post-mortem. The upshot of that was that the entire medicine was structured on the external observations of disease. Signs and symptoms, pulse, tongue, eyes, everything they observed, much better than probably what we do today. They were meticulous physicians. As for the insight, they knew nothing. No anatomy means no physiology. No physiology means no pathology. No pathology means all equal to quackery from modern standpoint of scientific medicine. And there was a fifth aspect, equally important. One is to preserve our health, diet. They went into great extremes examining diet on a philosophical basis. Today you have nutrition in terms of water, fats, carbohydrates, proteins, vitamins, minerals, trace elements and so on you have examined. And today we look at it from many other aspects. We have oxidants and antioxidants and so many things. When you go to eat, right, you, you are completely confused when you see a menu. You don't know what to eat. But they examined it from the viewpoint of yin and yang diets, macrobiotic diets, natural foods, and then breathing exercises, manipulation, massage, the three M's, manipulation, massage, meditation, and many forms of exercise like uh, Qigong, Tai Chi, have you heard of these exercises? Right, all these, mostly to keep people well, to maintain their health. By some means, in ancient times, they, they discovered points on the body which had therapeutic effect, and they took points which had the least common denominator. Points which had a similarity. 
of function. For example, there is one point for asthma, one point for fullness of the chest, one for breathing difficulty, one for skin disease, one for the nose, one for breathing. They took all those points which had a similarity and drew a line and called that line a meridian or a channel. You follow? Points which had similar function. In, do, in doing so, they discovered that there are 12 channels on one side and the same on the other. And these channels, for example, this channel which pertaining to the functions of the lung and breathing, they said it was connected to an internal organ called the lung. Right? Lung channel connected to the lung internal organ. And in doing so, there were 12 internal organs. From here, bottom of my neck to my perineum, that area of my body is called my trunk. And my trunk, there is a big cavity. And that is called the body cavity. And in my body cavity, there are 11 internal organs and the body cavity itself which regulates and harmonizes the functions of the other 11, the body cavity itself is the 12th internal organ. So the viewpoint of traditional Chinese medicine is that there are 12 internal organs in my body cavity connected on each side to 12 channels. Paired channels like my right shoe and my left shoe, they are all in pairs. And the channels are named after the name of the internal organ. Thus we have the lung channel, the large intestine, stomach and spleen, etc, etc, 12 of them. Further, they are regulated by two more channels, that is That is my trunk. There are twelve organs. Six there. Six here. 12 in all, and some are positive, some are negative. These are the positive, that is the negative. The positive ones are called yang. They are the male organs. The female or negative are called yin, and they are correlated to each other. One positive to one negative. Like one husband, one wife, no adultery, right? One husband, one wife. There are six pairs of organs, and on each side, there are channels running. Left side, right side. Of each of them, they are running 12 on this side, 12 on that side. Of the yin and the yang. In addition, in this trunk, there is a hole at the bottom. Put your finger there, hold a hole at the top. That is your mouth cavity where you put the food and the other cavity where the feces go out, that is your anus. From the mouth to the anus, there is, that is your mouth. and that is your inner. In the front line, that is your front, from the anus to the mouth, there is one channel. It has no organ. It is called the front channel. And in the back, put your finger to the anus, and on the back midline channel, the back midline channel, 
is another channel that is going called the back channel. It goes over the top of the head and comes here. The back channel is called the do channel, meaning the governing channel. And the front channel is called the rain channel. Rain channel. Two channel and rain channel. Back and front channel. The rain channel is the yin channel that governs the activities of all the yin organs. The do channel or the governing channel governs the activities of all the do of all the yang organs, yang organs and yin organs. And the do and ren channels are correlated to each other. At a point on the top of your head, put your hand there, top of your head. And that is called the governing point on the That point is called the pai hui do 20, 20th point. Pai hui. So that is the simple scheme that they worked out of how a human being is. And on those channels we talked about how many channels? Twelve this side, twelve this side, twelve pairs and two midline channels. Fourteen main channels there are four. Got it? How many? Yes. Twelve plus two. Twelve paired channels or organ channels. And the two midline channels makes fourteen. There are some three hundred and sixty-five acupuncture points in those channels. Three hundred and something like that. And of which if you study about twenty, twenty-five of the main points you can do very good at punch. Huang Din Aging, meaning in Chinese, the yellow emperors, Huang Yellow, Huang Ho, is one of the longest rivers in the world. It is the yellow river. Huang Di is the yellow emperor. He is called, he was called Huang Di because he was born on the banks of the Yellow River. Huang Di, Nei is internal, Jing is a classic. Yellow Emperor's classic of internal medicine. About two or three hundred years before Christ, there was collected in this book, classified, codified, all the known knowledge up to that point. And this book is in two different uh, parts. Part one and part two. Part one, part two. Part one is called Ling Shu. Part two is called Su Wen. These names are not important. These are not important. But what is important is there are two parts of this classical book from which we practice our medicine even today. You don't practice your Western medicine from the book of Hippocrates. The Corpus Morboris is your book of scientific western medicine when it started in the island of Kos 500 years before Christ. But we practice our traditional medicine on the same principles, on the same acupuncture points as laid out in this book. And I said two parts of the book. And that is very important. Part one of the book forms about 80 to 85 percent of the book, the larger part of the book. 
The larger part of the book talks about prevention. It does not talk about treating and curing illness. And that is the most important thing. The high watermark of Chinese civilization, as far as medicine is concerned, is that at that period, they were giving more stress on prevention of disease rather than curing illness. It is said in that book, treating an illness is like digging a well after you have got thirsty. Too late. It is said in that book, treating an illness is like forging the weapons of war after the battle had begun. Too late, you are going to lose the battle. It is there in that book. If you were appointed a doctor to that area in ancient times, by an edict of the emperor, all the people around that area paid you every month as long as they were well. And they stopped paying you when they got ill. What would you do? You wouldn't be wasting your time warming the chairs and seated here. You would be going round to your village, telling people, wash your hands, keep your fingernails short, brush your teeth, don't smoke, don't drink too much, wash your salads, eat healthy food, take exercise. Have you done it? The ancient Chinese physicians, when they found and discovered that things were happening with needles, with moxa, with herbs. They were looking round for an explanation. Today, your modern medicine, your modern scientific medicine, some people call it allopathic medicine. Your scientific medicine is based on the underpinnings of physics and chemistry and organic chemistry, what you call science. In those days, there was nothing called science. They looked around for an explanation because, unfortunately, human beings always ask why. So you have to give some kind of alibi, you understand? Any alibi. For example, some years ago, many years ago, my next door neighbor had a very young boy, very intelligent boy. One day he came and asked me, Uncle, you have a television set. I said, yes. How does that work? Now you see, I know nothing about television, cars, nothing. Chris, I don't know anything about these things. So he asked me, how does that work? Now I didn't want to look stupid to this fellow. And I saw one fellow was reading the news. I said, can't you see, there is a small man inside that box. And that is why it is coming. Oh, is that so? And he was satisfied, went home. Two or three days later, he came and asked me, what happens when you put it off to this man? You know? You get the point? So that was a harder question. I said, you know, when you go to your room in the night, when you put off your light, what happens? He says, I go to bed and sleep. Same thing that fellow does then. <laughs> See, that was many years ago. Now he's a qualified doctor. When he looks at me, he knows I'm a great bluffer. <laughs> <laughs> but at his level of thinking, that was good. You have to tell something. So they looked around for an explanation. On the one side, there was the Confucian doctrine. Not good enough, because it was a whole motley of laws how you must behave in front of the emperor, in your own family, in front of your slaves, how you must behave in the bedchamber. Very important, I have written a book about it called Tao of Sex. One of my best-selling books of sex. You see. When the Confucian doctrine was in vogue, there was a very similar, another man, that was, his name was Lao Tse. Some people spell it with a E, Lao Tse. 
Lao Tse lived at the same time as Confucius. He was the keeper of the library. Lao Tse wrote a book and the name of the book is that is the name of the book Tao the way that things happen you pronounce this with a slightly D sound not Tao Tao and the name of the book is Tao De Jing meaning the classic on the way the word Tao means the way the way the way that things happen in nature Lao Tse structured a philosophy in which man can live in harmony with how things happen in nature the harmony of nature in fact he was the world's first environmentalist he said that in this entire universe all is energy energy and he said the energy is chi that is energy this energy is everywhere it's very comfortable with modern cosmology modern physics all basic things in the world is energy but this energy by itself cannot be appreciated seen cannot interact it all works through matter it must materialize that is thousand percent congruent to modern physics this energy materializes in the universe that Lao Tse observed in the form of five elements and the five elements are fire earth metal water and wood they create each other energy and the five elements you throw water into your garden what happens you get trees that is wood from water you get wood when they are old you make a fire to cook or for your winter the ash goes down to the earth and forms part of it the earth and from the earth comes the most valuable stuff in those days metals silver and gold and so on and from the solid state of metal we get the liquid this is called the productive cycle or the reproductive cycle Sheng. So Lao Tse said his thesis was the whole universe that he observed was energy and it is guided by a law, a constant that is called the negative and the positive forces which I mentioned earlier. The negative is called the yin and the positive is called the yang <coughs> that is the thesis of Lao Tse it is on this that the ancient Chinese physicians based their empirical observation and build a superstructure of their medicine on the Taoistic theory now I will tell you something about yin and yang all things in the universe have, have negative and positive components it is a duality there is nothing single by itself there is no up 
without down. There is no left without right. There is no inside without outside. Have you seen a man with only his insides going with no outside? There is no good without bad. There is no beautiful without ugly. You understand? If everybody was as beautiful as I am, then there are no beautiful people, no ugly people. You understand? Somebody else has to be ugly so that you are beautiful. That is the duality. They are not separate components. What is called male and female are, are different parts of each other. The whole thing of liberation and women's liberation and equality is a myth. There is no such thing. Men and women are complementary to each other. They are different parts of each other. There cannot be equality. They are unequal. Both are unequal and they fit each other neatly to produce one single entity in the Tao. If you try to equalize, you bring chaos. And that was. Therefore, everything positive has negative. And in this, if this is a reproductive cycle, there must be a destructive cycle. That is a destructive cycle. Water destroys fire, fire destroys the metal, and axe destroys wood, and the roots destroy the earth, the earth absorbs the water. That is called the co-cycle or the destructive cycle. Everything. But, you see, in every yin there is yang, and in every yang there is yin. You see the logo of our association. is the yin and the yang with a needle in between, the acupuncture needle. Acupuncture needle, what does it represent? It represents the second oldest profession in the world. And like the first one, we have to satisfy our client with a small needle. It is a life philosophy. It is probably the oldest philosophy on, in the world. The oldest man who pointed out the importance of ecology and preserving our environment. Lao Tzu said, man is part of the Tao, man is part of the environment. All laws that apply to nature must apply to man. On this theory, this is the theory which was borrowed from Lao Tse to form the underpinnings of traditional Chinese medicine. And they said that the body has energy and they equated the different aspects of our internal organs with the five elements and that good health was a balance of the yin and the yang factions of your body. And any imbalance of yin and yang produced what is called dis-ease, a disorder, a lack of an order. Dis-ease, a lack of ease, which was disease. And the purpose of treatment, whether it is acupuncture, moxibustion, surgery, tablets, pills, injection, whatever you do, it is to bring the yin and yang back into balance. These ideas may look archaic, crude, historical, but not so. Today, the center point of scientific Western medicine is that illness is an imbalance of your psychoimmunoneurology for whatever purpose, and it produces a lack of that balance. And that is called, in Western scientific medicine, homeostasis. Homeostasis. Homeos is the similarity and likeness and stasis is to keep it static. And the greatest physiology of this century, Canon, he invented the term homeostasis. It is a lack of homeostasis which produces disease and the tablets you give, and the injections you give, and the acupuncture, whatever you give, is to bring it back into balance. So that today's ideas of disease are not too far removed from the ideas of the ancient people from ancient times. There is a cause 
There is a first cause of everything. Cause gives rise to an effect. This effect is the first effect. This becomes the cause number two. That is the first. This becomes the effect number two. That becomes another cause, another effect, another effect. And on and on it goes. This is the cause and effect. It is very simple. There is a cause followed by an effect. That is the scientific method. The human body, once again, is like this. It's built of different levels. Your body has a material body. Mind, spirit, emotions, query a soul, soul of man. Query, is he related to a god or Tao or Allah or whatever? Western scientific medicine and surgery and anesthesia are the best methods of treating man as applied to his material body. But the mind and the spirit and the emotions of man when the patient comes and tells you, Doctor, I can't sleep, I worry, I am anxious, I don't get an erection, my wife is not uh, satisfied with her ejaculation. Yes, these are all problems. Now, they are not contained within the cause and effect. Because Western medicine treats everything in a scientific manner, which is the reductionist method. The human body is looked upon like a mechanism as a wristlet or a car or as an aeroplane. As a machine, that is the methodology. And that applies to the body of man. There is no known science, not even Freudian, to really explain how our mind and spirit and emotions work. And the doctor looks upon only parts of the patient. He doesn't look upon the totality of the patient. That is what we have in Taoistic, traditional medicine. We look upon the whole patient. It is not so important to know what kind of disease a man is having. It is more important to know what kind of man is having the disease. The approach is holistic. In holistic medicine, we are not in separate compartments. We take the entirety of the body and see the imbalance and we try to balance the energy. This is an energetic medicine. In the Western scientific medicine, we are not dealing with any energy. We assume there are no energies in man, although we do an electrocardiogram, electroencephalogram, and all those waves that you see are energy waves. We assume there is nothing called energy. We are looking into the chemistry of man, the chemical aspect. This is a chemical medicine, this is a bioenergetic medicine. That is, each has its own area. Therefore, each is not the truth by itself. As this century draws to a close, we have to see the bottom line what we have done. Most certainly, the record of scientific medicine is brilliant, but there are a number of blemishes. The first shortfall is, it is only a medicine for our material body. Secondly, the most spectacular things that we have discovered, the antibiotics, penicillin, Streptomycin, and we call them an oreomycin and, and so many other sins today are sins to our body because what with the unnecessary use of many of these antibiotics, we have 
created number of monsters of resistant forms of bacteria and parasites. I was in North America, they are shouting, tuberculosis is on the upswing in New York. Streptomycin, rifampicin, they are not working. Leprosy is in the upswing in Africa, in South America. And what with AIDS and so on, what is the antibiotic? Go to Bangkok, you find the best brothels in the world, you can enjoy yourself. And, but don't get gonorrhea, civilis. There is no antibiotic. It is called the Vietnam Rose, a gonorrhea which is totally resistant to the known antibiotics of today. With all these problems that are looming, what kind of stuff are we going to use? That is going to be a critical question. That is why we must remember all medicine was made by man. Man himself is imperfect. Therefore, all these different medicines we have made are imperfect. In that humble spirit, we must learn to take the best out of all medicines and combine them, integrate them to produce a better medicine for the next century. All these compartments of Western, Eastern, traditional Ayurveda are all quirks of history. <coughs> that is why we have to get together and form, structure a better medicine, an integrated medicine for the next century. The ancient physicians borrowed this theory. This was a theory of life, of business, of government, of war, of day-to-day -day happenings, and structured this on the human being. They took the five elements and said that the interior of your body are The twelve internal organs, those are the twelve internal organs. And there are heart and pericardium, heart and pericardium, small intestine and sanjiao is the body cavity. That is the fire, fire. Spleen and stomach, lung and large intestine, kidney and urinary bladder, liver and gallbladder represented the five elements, fire, earth, metal, water, and wood. These are the internal organs. These organs on the periphery of your body, they were related to various channels, and those channels around the periphery of your body form the channels or meridians under your skin. Also, we said, there is your head above there, that is your head, that is your mouth with your tongue hanging out there, can you see the tongue? And there is a governor, what is the governor? The governor is the do 20, I already told you, Pai Hui, Pai Hui means the meeting point of a hundred points the point which governs all other points on the top of your head. There are 12 organ channels, right? 12 organ channels. And the energy takes 24 hours to go through them. And divided by the 12 channels, the peak energy is in how many hours? 24 by 12, how many? What is the answer? Two years, there. Yeah. There are some very clever people in this seminar. Two. The peak energy is at two hours. 
Let us take the energy first starts in the lung channel, the lung channel. Two hours of the lung channel is three to five in the morning. We will start here and we will say lung channel, three to three a.m. to five a.m. lung channel. The next channel is the large intestine channel till 7 a.m. Till 9 a.m. is the stomach channel. And till next one, two hours more, 11 a.m. is the spleen channel. The next one, till 1 p.m. is the heart channel. And so on, through the 12 channels, 3 a.m. to 5 a.m. in the lung channel. What is the meaning of that? The ancient Chinese said that lung disorders, lung means lung, respiratory pathway, nose, sinuses, <coughs> lungs are also related to skin. 3 to 5 o'clock in the morning, if you take 100 patients with lung problems, skin problems, sinus, rhinitis, sinusitis, and ask them, excuse me, what time of the day is your, are your symptoms worse? You will find that the vast majority of them will tell you 3 to 5 o'clock in the morning. You know that? That is a fact. That is called the time for the lung 3 to 5. 5 to 7 a.m. in the morning. I ask you, not only diseases, even normal physiology. 5 to 7 in the morning, what is the whole world doing? They are seated on their toilet seat and fighting it out, the large intestine to empty your stomach. You understand? And that is the important thing. That is normal physiology. Then 7 to 9 o'clock in the morning, what do you do? The hotel tells breakfast time is between 7 and 9 because they have studied traditional Chinese medicine. <laughs> you understand? And that is called break fast. You are breaking your fast because all night you have eaten and your stomach is empty. Spleen, pancreas, digests it from 9 to 11. Then if you have a job, you go to work. That is the heart brain time. Till 11 in the noon is the peak of your work and anxiety. And so on and so forth. Till late in the evening, the candles come out and the champagne bottles are in the cooler and the lights get dim that is the kidney urinary bladder time kidney urinary bladder is also related to sex it is only in the evenings when we start thinking about sex but of course there are some people who think about sex right round the clock that is abnormal this is called this is called the noon midnight law this is called the noon midnight law the law of five elements I told you, the yin and yang theory I told you, this is called the noon midnight law, the noon midnight law. These are number of theories, the five element theory, the yin and yang, the noon midnight law. It is also called the midday midnight law. These changes of function Depending on the time of the day, it is called biorhythm. I went to medical school before I think most of you were born, 1940s. I learned physiology and they told me that the body functions to the same level throughout the day. There is no difference at that time. Until they discovered many strange phenomena. We were going in jet planes. We started going in jet planes. What happens when you go in a jet plane? I came from Colombo to here, Brisbane, then I came. Time is different from there and here. I am trying to sleep at the time that it is going to be sleeping time in Sri Lanka and I am awake at the time
that it should be waking time there. I am going to the toilet at the wrong time. Why? Be that phenomenon is called, when you come from another place to here, your body is working on the biorhythm there. It is called jet lag. Jet lag. You heard of this term, jet lag. Is that correct? No, that is all rubbish. There is nothing called jet lag. I am telling you, although I am suffering from it. <laughs> right? Yes, I, I am still suffering from it. That is why I went to the toilet at the wrong time. Ten o'clock is early morning there, so I went there to the toilet to get. There is nothing called jet lag. The jet pilot, he was a very good pilot. He came in time. There was no lag in the jet. It is body lag. You understand? My body is lagging in the time there. You understand? The ancient Chinese discovered this. And we use this formula of noon midnight law. It is called circadian rhythm or biorhythms. And today in Western medicine we have discovered that there is a small structure on your brain called the pineal body, which gives a chemical which helps to control your biorhythm. Our bodies are encoded in a similar way to the, our environment, and that is the Tao. We must go with the nature of our environment. That is called the noon midnight law. So there are two levels of energy, one going through that is called from one organ to the other, creating this. And this creation, where you get energy from one to the other, is called the mother-son law. The mother-son law, the noon midnight law, the yin and yang, the five elements, all guided by the chi or energy. There is also a relationship to our sense organs. How many sense organs? Five of them. This is related to tongue, the fire. The earth is related to the mouth, that is your mouth. The metal is related to your nose, that is your nose. The water is related to your ear, that is your ear and the wood is related to your eye. The wood is liver. If you start drinking too much tonight, look at your eye tomorrow morning. The excess is shown in the eye. If you are a pediatrician or embryologist, they will tell you if a child is born with a deformed ear, first thing you must look for is the abnormality of kidneys, congenital abnormalities of the kidneys, and the genitourinary system, the Chinese knew a thing or two. So, fire is related to your tongue, earth to your mouth, the metal to your nose, and the water to the ear, and the wood to the eye. The internal organs in the mother-son cycle are the five elements inside, and in between, what, are th what is there? What is there? Is your muscles and tendons and ligaments and bones and joints and cartilage and fascia and blood vessels? And that is in a reticular formation, that is your intermediate level of energy. So, according to borrowing from Taoistic theory, looking at a human being, there are three levels of energy. And of course, to complete the picture, you already know this, there is the core cycle that is controlling it. That is the yin, is the productive cycle, the core cycle. That is how a human being looked to the traditional physician. You study your anatomy, your physiology, your biochemistry, all that, how much, two or three years in your medical school, and you have a certain mental picture of your human being. That is a simplification they made out on the underpinnings of the Taoistic theory how a human being looks like. Very simple, isn't it? See how much, how many years you wasted 
if you came before in one sweet morning, we would have told you all our anatomy and physiology. That is their great genius. They took this very complicated, complicated, complicated picture of our human functioning and reduced it to a very simple mnemonic. And one other important thing, on both hands, you know there is your radial pulse. They laid great stress on this pulse. On the left hand, that is my left hand, there were three pulses in these three pulse positions, proximal, intermediate and distal, on my right hand, there were, that is my right hand, there were pulses, and each of the pulses were related to a pulse position as follows. This was related to fire, this was related to wood, water. This was related air, earth and water. That completed the picture. That is how a normal human being looked like. And when there was an imbalance of this human being, you diagnose the case from a history of the case. History of the case. Two, by tongue diagnosis. And third, pulse diagnosis and ear diagnosis. This was called the relationship of the left pulse to the right pulse. The left was the male pulse, the right is the female pulse, the right side. If you have any difficulty of remembering which side which, remember women are always in the right. 